In today's video, I have my good friend and renowned bespoke shirt maker, Will Whiting, in the office, and together we're gonna go over some of the myths of bespoke shirts. I'm Kirby Allison, and I love helping the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes. Join me as we explore the world of quality, craftsmanship, and tradition. Will, hey, thank you so much for making it to Dallas. I guess, you know, this is, uh, we're fortunate enough to have this be one of your stops on your U.S. truck show. So uh, that's really exciting to have you here. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Yeah. So in this video, um, I was thinking we could go over some of the myths of bespoke shirts, because like with all things bespoke, there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, misconceptions out there. For sure. That I'm sure as a bespoke shirt maker, you're kind of constantly encountering. So I thought it'd be fun to just kind of go over those and we could have a conversation uh, just kind of about some of these, uh, these nuanced kind of misconceptions of bespoke shirt making. So first and foremost, we've got a nice drink. It's the end of the day. So, um, you know, thanks for making it down. Cheers. And, you know, cheers to a successful trunk show schedule. Um, you're off to New York next, aren't you? Yeah, tomorrow. Okay. And so uh, how developed is your U.S. trunk show uh, kind of tour? I mean, you, you do San Antonio, Dallas, and New York. Yep. Um, um, will you be adding cities? Yeah, definitely. I started with New, New York in my first year. And that's slowly developed, mm -hmm. um, always open to new destinations. Of course, the West Coast will probably sort of come up soon. Yeah. Uh, they make a stop there. I'll be maybe doing Texas twice a year. Okay. I've currently been that's doing great. it just once. Um, but yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah. Well, let's jump into this. And it's, uh, this should, it's just kind of a casual flow. And you'll have to let me know what you think. These are the results of uh, some questions we had on Instagram and some things that were... Uh, were asked quite often. So the first one is um, that bespoke shirts should fit slim. What do you think of that? Okay, so for me, bespoke shirt is all up to the up to the client. But the most important part is the shoulders. The shoulders have got to be right. If they're not, the shirt for me will never fit someone right. So for it to be slim, it's just personal preference. Okay. You don't want it to be too close because it'll look tight. I have clients who want really fitted close shirts and I sometimes have to say to them, look, you're going to put on potentially a little bit of weight with time or it could be a At little bit... seasonally of... fluctuate a little yeah, bit. Of course. Yeah. I mean, that, like myself, I mean, I've always liked to cut a close fitting shirt and I could probably do it in a couple of inches in the waist yeah. at the moment. So I think that's just down to personal preference. But it's interesting to hear that, um, you know, to think of it as a shirt really sits on you in the shoulders and then everything else kind of drapes down and so you know oftentimes a lot of people go to bespoke because it's difficult for them to find a shirt that fits properly through the body yep. but really that's a personal preference that you can add or take off yeah. you know kind of an inch you know a few inches depending on how they want the shirt to fit but if it's not right in the shirt shoulders nothing else matters I think so and that also what comes into that is is balance. Okay. The same with tailors, you, you've got a front, so the front and the back. back balance of the shirt and that affects the sort of where the armhole is. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that balance is right. You want to make sure that the armhole is in the right position. So people say, well, high armhole. Yeah, of course, but it's all relative. Okay. Someone might be the same height as someone else, but they could have an armhole an inch or two lower. Okay. So just need to make sure when I'm doing all my measures and check measures and cutting a shirt and doing the trial shirt, all these things are um, right for that person. You could have a hunchback, um, you may have a very developed chest and that mm -hmm. would all affect the balance of the shirt. Okay. And then how you would kind of cut the yoke and the shoulders and everything together. Of course, of course. So once that's right, because I, I always felt sometimes with certain shirts I was wearing before I got into bespoke that I was fighting with the shirt because mm -hmm. it would, the block of that shirt um, was cut for someone who wasn't similar to my body type. Yeah. So actually that sometimes leads on to other questions. Some people can have a ready-to-wear shirt and it fits them great, and some a ready-to-wear shirt from another company may be awful. Yeah, well that's one of the things that I see with the shirts that you made for me, the beautiful kind of button-down collar shirts, is that they do sit naturally on the shoulders. I mean, they just sit, you know, effortlessly, and then they kind of drape down, and you're not feeling it kind of pull forward or pull back. Mm. You know, I'm not ever really kind of messing with the collar in order to pull the shirt back forward on me. And uh, I guess that really all comes down to the shoulders. Yep, yep. Yeah. Interesting. Well, uh, myth number two, um, floating or unfused collars are better. So we really have to look at the history. Okay. And 
typically a floating interlining, which is just a piece of interlining, was used historically because that's all that was available. Mm -hmm. And then when, as times have progressed and technology, they've applied a glue to the interlining that can be stuck to the outer fabric, as you say, and it can create a slightly more uh, cleaner aesthetic. Mm -hmm. It also helps with pressing. Yeah. So, Does it also help with the shrinking? No, I think <clears throat> if you've got the same piece of interlining, one with glue and one without, if the interlining has been treated in the same way by the person who's making it, mm -hmm. that shouldn't affect it too much. Okay. So going back, a lot of shirts are made with floating interlining. It's actually a little bit more challenging to make a collar like that. Um, I won't go into it, because <laughs> I'd have to show you. Yeah. Um, to dispel the myth on this topic, I think it all comes down to personal preference again. Okay. Okay, so a floating interlining can sometimes be a little bit more softer in the feel. Um, it also requires someone to press it right, because yeah. when you're pressing that type of fabric, mm -hmm. you can sometimes create creases in this part yeah. of the shirt Absolutely. that can look quite ugly. So yeah. a diffuse piece of interlining. You don't have to worry about that. No, it, sometimes you don't even have to, worst case, you didn't even have to press it. Yeah, okay. So I guess a, a diffused uh, interlining or fused collar and cuff is going to look stiffer, look smoother, and smoother. require probably less maintenance yes. or less skilled pressing than with a, a floating uh, interlining, right? So, so I tend to explain that to the client when they came in, come in. They can have whatever they like with me. They can have different weights of interlining, different stiffness, you know, a little bit softer, mm -hmm. heavier weight, softer weight. I tend to just want to make their life easier. If they, if they want to press it themselves and, and they want to experience how a floating interlining is, yeah, of course. But most of the time, people nowadays will default to fuse. Really? Okay. Yeah. So the majority of what you do is fused. Yeah. And do you have, I mean, you know, one of the things that, you know, that I think about when I think of fused interlining is the risk of having bubbling. Yep. Is that still a problem with today's fusings? Well, it would be perhaps if you're buying a low quality fusible, okay. uh, but as time, time has gone on, the quality of um, the interlining has improved a lot. I mean, there's specialist companies making this that sell millions of meters a year. Okay. And the most important thing though, which makes it more challenging for a bespoke maker when you're very small, is that you need the right machinery to fuse the interlining. So okay. at my workshop, I have an industrial fusing machine, okay. and that applies a certain amount of pressure when it's fusing to ensure that you don't get that bubbling effect. Yeah, because pressure and heat, right? Yeah, because if you're going to use an iron and, and press the fusible on, it's probably not enough pressure involved, uh, and it may find that it bubbles after you know six months or a year or so forth. So you need, yeah, you need the right setup. So if you're a small artisan, of course, using uh, a floating interlining can be easier. Yeah, hmm, interesting. Okay, the next one, which um, you know, I certainly was guilty of falling into in my earlier bespoke days, which is uh, the perception that thick mother of pearl buttons are better than thin mother of pearl buttons because thin buttons break. I think, in t I mean, I've very rarely come across uh, mother of pearl buttons breaking. If it's plastic, of course, it could break very easily. But more so, it's uh, what I had heard is because they're thicker, people think they're more expensive mm -hmm. and that's how they prefer it. I uh, Personally, I think it's a lot easier to have a, a thinner mother of pearl button. It's a lot easier to button, yeah. especially in the hand. It is uh, much easier. Of course, if you've got a big, thick mother of pearl button on the, on the collar and you're wearing it with a tie, I always think that it's, it's going to make the tie yeah. protrude. Um, it can be a little bit more difficult to get the thick butter through the buttonhole and put more stress on that buttonhole. Mm -hmm. So, um, however, I do I, I, I offer a range of different button styles to okay. suit whatever the client demands. But personally, the, the shirts typically come with a, with a thinner button. Thin. Yeah. And so what are the characteristics of a really high quality mother or pearl button? I mean, if it's not thickness, what is it? So, it's cut from a, a shell and that mother of pearl button, the highest quality, will have no defect on it. So if you look at that button and you turn it over and look at the hind, mm -hmm. if it's completely clean and it's... You know, With no spotting or anything. Yeah, of course, and there's no white, okay. that means it's been taken from the best part of the shell. And what if is it, the best part? The edges? Or well, the... typically wherever you're not going to get any of the outer okay. shell, okay. Uh, 
being part of that button. So, mm -hmm. as I was saying, if you look at the back side of a, a mother of pearl button, and it's got sort of white or it's got this strange um, colors uh, yeah, to I've it. Seen. You know, it's from uh, it sort of could be more from the off cut. Okay. So the only, for example, the only buttons that I offer at the highest quality, yep. I can't compromise, mm -hmm. and you'll pay less normally for not such high quality, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Interesting. Well, I mean, it was one of the things once I, I started really kind of dabbling with some of the higher-end bespoke makers like Charmay and like with you that I uh, really discovered, you know, truly beautiful and really very thin mother of pearl buttons. And not only are they easier to button, right, but if it's a high enough quality, I've never had one break. Exactly. You know, they, I mean, inevitably they, you know, the, the, the shank breaks and the button falls off before I've ever seen a button break. I guess it's the plastic buttons that you really worry about, or right. some of the pearlized plastic buttons that look like mother of pearl, but really Again. at the end of the day aren't. And oh, they could be. They've just got half of it is pearl and half of it's plastic underneath. So yeah. you, okay. again, you've just got to just got to make sure that the buttons that you're uh, on the shirt that you're yeah. buying are the right quality. Yeah, there's a real elegance and delicacy to a, a thin, beautiful mother of pearl button that you know that when in the morning as I'm buttoning my shirt, uh, and especially with shanks. I mean, I'm a, a love shanks on, on buttons because it makes it easier to button that I really appreciate kind of in the morning. Of it's kind of one of those small details that, you know, only the person buttoning their shirt really has an opportunity to appreciate that. Okay, next myth. Um, this is a little bit of a loaded one, but bespoke is always better. That's not always the case. Uh, even a Daniel uh, alluded, that, alluded to that in another conversation. So it all comes down to the maker. Mm -hmm. You could have, so first of all, we have to define what bespoke is. So for me, bespoke means you're having your own individual pattern made, mm -hmm. opposed to a pre-made pattern that is altered. Okay. So typically a made to measure or a made to order, there is a block pattern mm -hmm. and it is altered. Yeah. Um, bespoke, so kind of scaled based off the measurements. Of course. So whereas in my case, I'm cutting a pattern from scratch, and therefore that's from my experience of taking certain measurements and check measurements. So that's what bespoke is. But of course, if in either situations, you can have someone good or bad at it. Yeah. It could be someone who uh, doesn't understand their made-to-measure block system. Mm -hmm. They perhaps don't measure right, and therefore the client gets an inferior product. The same could go for bespoke. Yeah. And at the end of the day, um, you can have a great made-to-measure made product, and you can have a bad bespoke, or you can have a great bespoke and... Yeah. Not all are created equal. Exactly. And it's not a totally linear scale. Yeah, so for me, I have my own formula, and that's developed with time. I also take a lot of check measures. So mm -hmm. I've got my paper, and, and, and I'll draft a pattern um, from those measurements, mm -hmm. and then also I've got my check measurements. So if I'm sketching something out and I'm, and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, hmm, this, this doesn't really add up right, I can look at my check measurements, because mm -hmm. of course everyone's body is different. Mm -hmm. uh, they could just have really, really uh, broad shoulders, um, and their neck might not be that, uh, you know, in proportion with their shoulder yeah. um, width. So then I know, actually, I look to my check measures, it's okay and I'll confidently go on and finish the pattern. Once I finish the pattern, I can cut the fabric and create a base fitting. And with my bespoke process, I want to put the time, the front end time in, in those fittings yeah. and then recutting the pattern till we get it right. Yeah. And I guess one of the things that's different about a shirt maker than say a, a suit maker, a tailor, is that um, you know, once you kind of settle on the pattern and you cut the fabric, you know, your margins and your tolerances are so tiny that there's no do-over. If yep. you cut it wrong or if the pattern's off, you can't pull it apart and remake it. It's done. You have to scrap it and start over. Well, you may be able to um, unpick certain parts. You know, the yeah. sleeve's been set in, you could unpick it, but yeah, you don't typically have any excess fabric in there to let it out, or yeah. even if you want to take it in, it doesn't work as simple as that. So yeah, you've got to make sure the initial phase is done right. Yeah. So my other question with bespoke is, how important is it that the um, pattern maker be the one actually doing the measuring and then uh, doing the fittings? So I, I think that comes down to the team that you have in place. 
if, if you have a really well-defined measuring process mm -hmm. where the say the pattern cutter has spent a lot of time with the person measuring then it can work in harmony of course if there's a bit of a, a disconnection between yeah. those people then of course how do i know how long you're measuring the sleeve mm -hmm. at what what point at the hand or the wrist or where where are you uh, where are you doing it to so i i think you know it's great for me because I'm measuring and I'm cutting the pattern and I'm mm -hmm. doing the fitting. But as, as a business sometimes scales, if you want to scale up, uh, you have to have other people doing other roles. So you know, when I was, before I was working for myself, yeah, someone may be measuring who wasn't cutting the pattern. But it, it just taught me to have a really strict process in place. Yeah. yeah, and I guess at the end of the day, I mean, that's one of the things that it really matters is just having, especially, especially with shirt making where there's such a small tolerances is having a very strict process mm. and how things are doing the same way every single time because it's the only way that you can produce over thousands of shirts a consistent outcome. Yep. Okay, next myth. What about machine made versus handmade? Because even within bespoke, I mean, you've got the full range of, you know, fully machine made shirts mm. that, are, that are true bespoke, like Charvet is a fully mm. machine made shirt. Yep. Uh, all the way down to fully handmade, which, you know, you have a fully handmade. Yep. Uh, offer also, and you've got a fully machine made offer, and then something in between. So, yep. um, you know, is one better than the other? I think it comes down again, similar to that bespoke and made to measure question is uh, how good is the machine work and how good is the hand work in the shirt? Because both can be sloppy, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. So, for me, uh, I wanted to just be able to offer a mixture of different finishes because certain clients had different preferences. Of course, hand, weight, hand work can take longer. Um, but there's also a, a real skill in both. It's very difficult to uh, sew a machine-made shirt with uh, very you know, neat stitching in, around the collar and the cuffs and mm -hmm. uh, perhaps having uh, on the side seams quite a narrow uh, distance. So I think when any shirt is, whether it's handmade or hand-finished or machine-finished, you just want to make sure the quality is very high. Yeah. And yeah, of course, I mean, I have a preference for a handmade buttonhole. I think it's very aesthetically pleasing. Um, I like to see sometimes a uh, sleeve set in and finished by hand. And, but at the end of the day, it, it, it all fits what the, what the client's after and the yeah. look that they like. Yeah. yeah, and I guess some clients might prefer a really tight and neat aesthetic yeah. that really inevitably you get from machine yeah. you know, made. Uh, shirts, but then you know, like for instance, our my shirts are kind of that middle grade where yep. it's you know a little bit machine, a little bit by hand, and you know the certain items that I feel that I appreciate that tight kind of mm -hmm. symmetry and kind of organization to are done by machine. Yep. But then certain elements like the collar and the sleeves being set in by hand, I think really leverage the beauty of that handwork. Yep. Whereas you know, you know, doing the you know, the long seams of the collar, you know, by hand is kind of a little bit of an embellishment, in my opinion. Of course, I understand that. And uh, I think with the full hand offering that I, uh, that I have, there's a certain clientele that really yeah. likes that, but it's, it's a small, small amount. Small amount, yeah. Okay, next, um, uh, this comes down to fabric, which is the finer and more expensive the fabric, the better. Okay, so yes, in, in terms of the fineness that's on offer, uh, the yarn is is, uh, is is finer, the weave is typically tighter. Mm -hmm. Say when you're comparing a two-fold 120 to a two-fold 200, but it's not necess you know, necessarily better. Why is that? Because I feel that you probably get more longevity with a slightly um, uh, not so fine mm -hmm. fabric. Um, also, with the finer fabrics, they can a little bit, be a little bit more transparent. You don't get so much uh, durability out of it. Yeah. So it's more of a luxury. I, I, most of the clients that I deal with uh, prefer fabrics that are quite durable. Um, they like sort of a more of a feel to it. Yeah. Uh, also, the, the, the climate that, that I'm in, um, in, in the UK, although I'm here in the US, the fabrics with more body are preferred because it was less, like we said, there's less transparency involved. And warmer. Yep, and warmer, yeah. I mean, a, a two-fold 120 or 100 could be, in a poplin, could be 110 to 130 grams, whereas a two-fold 200, two-fold 
two forty, yeah, two ply um, would be could be something like eighty grams. Yeah, wow. So twenty to thirty yeah. percent less weight. And if that was a voil, it could be sixty five grams. That's crazy. Yeah, interesting. So, um, so yeah. So that, it comes down to the client preference. I mean, uh, one of my favorite wide cotton shirtings is actually a, I think a, you know, like a one ten. I mean, it's a really heavier weight. Uh, fabric that I think holds its press hmm. better throughout the day, it has zero transparency to it, and has a body that gives it a crisp, clean look that you wouldn't get from that same, yeah. you know, you know, shirt as like a super. Yeah, my 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 favorite is normally a, a two ply one forty. Okay, I think that's a really good um, middle balance, ground yeah. in terms of price, in terms of uh, durability, um, the feel. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So our last myth is that you have to launder your dress shirts every single time you wear them. Is that true? That every single time you wear a shirt, you should send it to the dry cleaners? Me personally, yeah, I'm, I'm laundering the shirts after every wear. Really? But I, I think it all depends because you could be wearing a casual shirt and you could have a vest underneath. Mm -hmm. um, you might not have the collar done up. So it might get less sort of wear. If you're wearing a white shirt, and you haven't got an undershirt, and the tie's done up, yeah, at the end of the day, there's, there's going to be discoloring in the back of the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's sweat in the armpit. You want to make sure that it's, it's well laundered. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you want to make sure a little bit of detergent is put into the collar mm -hmm. and into the armpit and into the cuffs, uh, and, and then to wash it through. But yeah. I, I typically recommend you don't need to put it on more than 30. Um, some clients hand wash. 30 degree centigrade, so yeah. that would be quite hot. Yeah. yeah, like warm water. Yeah, yeah, um, or a cold wash. But it all depends specifically how you, how you wear the shirt. Now, do you send your shirts out to be laundered, or do you launder them at home? No, I launder them myself. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, it's quite difficult to actually launder a shirt oneself. I mean, that's the preferred way to do it, because yeah. it's the most gentle with the shirt. But, you know, pressing a shirt actually requires quite a bit of skill. and takes time. I really enjoy it. How long I does it take you to press a shirt? I think I can do one in. We 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 should we should have a. Uh, we should time uh, you. We should do it on the show. Yeah, um, five ten minutes. You're kidding! I don't believe it. Yep, with a fuse collar. Really? Yep. There was a period of time where I was uh, laundering, and hand pressing all of Nathaniel's uh, school shirts, his little white dress shirts that he wears to school, and it would take me ten or fifteen minutes to you know to really press it properly, you know, and you need to take it out of the 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 laundry machine, uh, slightly damp. Right, because you don't want it to completely dry. Yeah, I actually I enjoy this topic because I think well I remember when I used to sh to press shirts years and years ago before I was even in sh making shirts and I used to hate it. Whereas now I feel I've defined a process and a f for pressing, and there's never a time when I think oh it's difficult to press this part. Mm. I have a sort of methodical process. Really, because the lifetime of any clothing. Uh, really can be measured in how many times you yeah. send it to the dry cleaners because they're so rough yep. with the garment. Yeah, especially here. There's especially a lot of, here. lot of heat put on the shirt. These 99 can... cent dry cleaners, I mean, you know, yeah. you get what you pay for. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, 20 yeah. or 30 trips to the dry cleaners and, you know, the shirt yeah. is either, you know, severely disformed or needs to be checked out. Yeah, I understand that. And you will get a lot more shrinkage as well. So if you're, you're, ha you're having a lovely shirt, you want to make sure you're looking after it. The same yeah. with, I'm sure there's people with lovely luxury cars. They make yeah. sure that it's uh, You're going to take it through the drive, you know, yeah. drive through car wash. Will, hey, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure, pleasure to, be here. You know, to have you here in the office. And uh, I appreciate you kind of walking through you know, these myths of uh, shirt making with us. I look forward to next time. Yeah, cheers.